<laughs> I'm usually on the other side of the camera. Today is the 27th of January, 2010. We are at the Terrace at Beaverwick in Slingerlands, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center out of Saratoga Springs, New York. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? Yeah, Thomas Shields, S-H-I-E-L-D-S, -E born in Albany, New York, 10-2050. Did you attend school in Albany? Yes, Albany High School, and, class of 68. Okay, and at that point, did you go on to college or did you go to work or into the service? I, shortly after high school, I enlisted in the Coast Guard. I wasn't taken for another six months, so I did work as a truck driver for six months and then okay. went in. Whereabouts uh, did you go for your basic training? Cape May, New Jersey in January of 69. How was that? Was that like a Navy basic? or? I, I believe it was very similar to, to uh -huh. any other basic training of that time. Um, a lot of yelling. Uh -huh. Was uh, that your first time away from home? Yes, it was. Uh -huh. Yeah, It was uh, first time away from home, first time away in the winter time. It was cold down there in January. Uh -huh. uh, just, and I, I remember very vividly the bus trip, the barracks, you know, the first night in the barracks, the first morning thereafter where you get up and just follow the head in front of you, just keep running and you get a meal, you get a haircut, a very close haircut, mm -hmm. you get shots in the arms, you get an armful of clothing and you just keep running no matter where you're going and people are yelling at you no matter what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was very memorable. Uh -huh. well, once you completed, you, oh, how long was that basic training? You know, I, I think it was from January through April. Okay. I, I, the exact dates I don't remember, but it was January 19th, but I don't remember when, when I actually got out. I, I thought it was like an eight-week eight period. All right. Did you go on to a, a specialty school after that? No, I went to Sandy Hook, Sandy Hook New Jersey, a lifeboat station, mm -hmm. a search and rescue station there. Uh, I was assigned to, we had several small boats there, 30 and 40 foot boats, and I was assigned as a crewman on one of those boats. Now did you go through an on-the-job training program there? Yes, yep, and it was typical on the job of the day, mm -hmm. you know, just do this and boom. Okay. Um, so I was the, uh, the seaman on, on board the ship and it was a, a, a crew of three. Okay, and basically what did you do? Um, I was responsible for the cleanliness of the, of the boat when we were in port, when we were tied up, mm -hmm. um, and also like operate the fire pump, assist the engineer, substitute for the coxswain in driving the boat when we we're out, to, out on the water. Um, during search and rescue, it was my responsibility as a seaman to leave the ship. Mm -hmm. The fireman couldn't leave the ship, um, and naturally the coxswain couldn't leave the ship. So. There was a time when we had to pick up a, uh, a dead body of a young guy and, uh, and I had to get off our, our boat to get onto a private boat because the water was too shallow there and, and assist there and bring him back mm -hmm. in a litter. Um, what, was he a drowning victim? or? Yeah, he was. He was a water skier that uh, he actually got dumped and uh, got hit by a, another boat oh. in the Shrewsbury River down in New Jersey. Okay. And uh, how much time did you spend a, aboard the, the boat? Were you on the boat every day, or it all depended? It's mm -hmm. uh, you know we, it was it was like a fire department more or less. Mm -hmm. You went out if there was an emergency call, or you went out do some some maintenance here and there. We we maintained some of the the shore stations where you have a tower with a number on it or a flashing light um, as an aid to navigation. Uh, we did some patrol work. We did you know just. Uh, sit in a particular place on the busy weekends, you would just sit and respond to calls from there. Mm -hmm. We responded to calls for jumping uh, people that jump from the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. We were very close to the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, we responded to boat sinking, boat fires, boats okay. broken down, things like that. Did that keep you fairly busy? In the summertime it was very busy and you didn't get a lot of time off. It was like uh, you worked eight days on and one day off and then seven days on and two days off so mm -hmm. it was it was pretty crazy did you work a lot of night hours or strictly during the daylight no it was any time they needed you pretty mm -hmm. much uh, there was a, a duty boat crew but if they were called out then naturally the next boat in line and, and the third boat or whatever whatever it took to get the job done mm -hmm. so uh, there was some night work involved 
Mm -hmm. What kind of uniform did you wear? A uh, chambray shirt and dungarees and boondockers. Mm -hmm. And the Dixie Cup or uh, we might have had a baseball cap then. Uh -huh. Okay, and what were your living quarters like? It was pretty nice. We, we Sandy Hook, New Jersey was a nice spot. Um, it, it was primarily an army base, but the, the tip of it was Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And we had a barracks there, uh, two-story barracks, good food, a mm -hmm. couple of great cooks there. Um, and the, the boats and the, the boat yard was remote from the barracks, so we had a couple of vehicles. We had a bicycle we could use to get from one to the other in an emergency. Mm -hmm. You just grabbed any particular vehicle. Mm -hmm. Or you ran over to the the boat yard and got on the boats from there. Mm -hmm. Now, how big were were those boats? You mentioned the the size of the crew, but um, they were there were there were steel hull boats that were uh, twin diesel engines. They were forty feet long. Mm -hmm. Then it was a single diesel engine, thirty foot fiberglass boat, and we also had one forty four foot motorized surf boat. People know it, know it as the one that actually can roll right over and, and right itself. Oh. If you got caught in the surf, you could, if you were strapped in, mm -hmm. it, it would do this. If you weren't strapped in, I'm not sure what would happen. Uh -huh. but, uh, that was not a real good, good good riding boat. It was very back and forth uh -huh. a lot. So, But it, it did its job. Mm -hmm. Now, how big was the unit itself? How, how many personnel were on that base? Um, we had probably about 30 or 40 people. Mm -hmm. There was five boats and with alternating crews of three each, and then there was support crews, the cooks, the yeoman, mm -hmm. um, quartermaster, uh, there was a lieutenant in charge, several chiefs mm -hmm. in charge of uh, a bosun mate chief and, and an engineering chief. What were the chiefs like? Were they hard to get along with? They were pretty good. They were, it was a pretty laid back place. You know, it was uh -huh. a family and uh, there was a lot of activity. The lieutenant was a big guy on, on uh, physical fitness, although he wasn't so physical himself. But mm -hmm. uh, So we played softball after lunch every day in uh -huh. the summertime, uh, as, as long as there wasn't a call. Mm -hmm. So you were out there playing for about an hour or so. And again, walking back and forth or running back and forth to the boats kept it pretty active. Mm -hmm. Um, the galley, they, they served good meals, and then it was also, it wasn't a, a closed galley, it was an open galley, so you could go in there and grab a sandwich at any time, mm -hmm. or an ice cream bar or whatever. It was uh, pretty interesting. I liked it there. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, usually ride with the same crew, or, or did that alternate quite a bit? You rode with the same crew generally. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if, let's say that your, your coxswain was uh, on leave or whatever, then... You, you threw on with another coxswain or whatever, but mm -hmm. you got to know and work with each other, and, and it was pretty much you knew your duties with your crew, mm -hmm. similar to a fire department, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that your duty was to keep the ship or the boat clean. Yes. Um, <clears throat> did that entail a lot of work, uh, constant it did. work? It did. The, 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 the steel boats were older mm -hmm. and uh, prone to rust. Mm -hmm. So it was constantly paint, being painted and stuff. So you were in basically salt water all the time. Correct, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the fiberglass boat was a little bit better, but the, there, was, there was some maintenance there, too. Mm -hmm. you know, every now and then you'd hit something in the water and ding it and have to patch it up. So we had a couple guys that were real good at the, applying the fiberglass and, and mixing the chemicals and applying the fiberglass and sanding and finishing. Mm -hmm. It was before the days of personal protective equipment, though, mm -hmm. you know, the masks were unheard of. Mm -hmm. You might wear eyeglass sure. protection, but uh, respirators and things like that were just not happening at that time. Were the boats kept in the water most of the time? I mean, like, when when the boat was <coughs> being repaired, was it dry docked, or...? Usually it was in the water. Okay. If we, unless we had to take it out of the water to get it repaired, and we, there was a facility there that we could pull it right out of the water there. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually they were kept in the water all year long. Mm -hmm. Were there women in the unit also? Um, no, not at that time. I don't. I don't believe there was any women in the Coast Guard in '69. Okay. 69. Okay. And uh, you <coughs> you stayed down there for for how long were you based there? I was only there about eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my first duty station, and then towards the end of the year, um, I had put in for damage control in school. And I was selected to to go to school, and that was at Governor's Island, mm -hmm. New York. 
What did you learn there? Everything about uh, shipboard stability, fire, um, firefighting, mm -hmm. um, repairing, uh, plumbing, carpentry, welding, everything but electrical pretty much, mm -hmm. and a little bit of electrical. How long was that school? Four months. Four months? Yes. And what rank were you at that point? I was a seaman apprentice when I went in, I believe, and graduated. You moved up to seaman. Mm -hmm. So I was. I, uh, was that like an E3 or E4? Or? That would be an E3. E3, okay. And then um, then once you graduate from school, you're, you're, you're a damage control, seaman damage controlman, E3. And then I made rank from there to third class petty officer and second class when I got out. Okay. And uh, once you completed that school, where did they send you? I was assigned to the Coast Guard Cutter Gallatin, mm -hmm. which was a 378-foot weather cutter out of Governor's Island as well. And we uh, we would go, basically we were out to sea for 30 days on a, on a what they call a weather station, which was a grid. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how far out to sea were you? Um, I couldn't see shore, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, we were out pretty far. We were up, you know, usually in the northern areas, up mm -hmm. by uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, up and through there. Um, and we did come further south, but it was like a 500-mile, square-mile grid mm -hmm. that we patrolled. And you provided uh, navigation aid to ships as well as aircraft, mm -hmm. um, naturally search and rescue. At that time, the Coast Guard wasn't too much involved with drugs and immigration as they are now. Mm -hmm. So it was just pretty much on the station and, and just waiting for something to happen there. Mm -hmm. Any uh, scary incidents with uh, like storms or rough water? We had a, we had a couple good storms there. The, 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 that class of ship had an aluminum superstructure and uh, the technology hadn't been developed yet to, to weld the aluminum to the metal. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there was a, 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 a storm at one time which caused the metal, the, the well to fail, so the whole superstructure might have, could have fell over, but uh, the, 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 the ship, was, the beam wasn't that great on the ship, so it mm -hmm. rocked a lot. So there, there, were, there were nights that you would move back and forth, and it, it asked in your, your profile here about funny stories for something to do, we'd go up in the main hold, that, which had a probably a 15-foot ceiling, mm -hmm. and when the ship was riding through the waves and you were going up and down through the waves as opposed to rocking back and forth, mm -hmm. you could actually jump and catch the beam on the ceiling about 15 feet high, you know? Oh, really? Yeah, it was great. You know, as the ship was going down, you jump up and, and you're able to grab this beam. The problem was getting off the beam <laughs> after you got up there, but we worked that out. So we got up <laughs> and that was, was some of the crazy things you do to keep yourself occupied. Uh -huh. So it was fun. What did you do on your time off on the on the ship? Uh, was there any entertainment? Or? Yeah, we had movies every night. The gunner's mate chief was in, in charge of securing the movies before we went out to sea, mm -hmm. and uh, he liked westerns, a lot of westerns. Uh -huh. I saw all the spaghetti westerns, and for some reason we wound up with the prime of Miss Jean Brody one cruise, at, you know, and it would show it over and over again, you know. <laughs> I don't know where where he got that one from. <laughs> But I do remember it. Okay. And uh, what were your quarters like on that boat? That uh, that was a fairly new ship. It was mm -hmm. only about four or five years old when I was on it. Mm -hmm. um, so we had pretty decent living quarters. There was uh, the, the bunks were only too high. Mm -hmm. uh, they were full metal. They weren't the the, uh, the uh, canvas slings that yeah. other people were used to. Um, clean, very clean, well tiled, well lit. Um, and there was some pretty good storage area on there too. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't as bad as uh, the older ship that I was on, but it, it was it was decent. Mm -hmm. It was air conditioned. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there was two jet engines to propel the ship, and they were right on the other side of the bulkhead. But it was about a quarter inch of steel. But the noise you got used to, and it almost lulled you to sleep, sleep after a while. Yeah. And how long were you on that ship for? I was on that about a year. Mm -hmm. And then there was an opening for a buoy tender out of New York City, the Coast Guard Cutter Firebush, mm -hmm. which was a 180-foot older 
uh, buoy tender at the time. So I got assigned to that. And uh, that was that was almost like a, a real job in that you went out every morning, attended to your work, mm -hmm. and usually you were, you were home every evening. You were tied up for dinner. What did you have to do with the with the buoys? The buoy tender, well, the greatest part of it was buoys. Um, in New York Harbor, you can imagine it's very busy, and we tended all the buoys all the way out into the Atlantic Ocean, the first buoy out there, buoy mm -hmm. tool alpha, they call it. Uh, which actually took the place of Ambrose Lightship when they decommissioned the lightships and put these permanent buoys in place. So we took care of all those. Now, now with the, by taking care of them, uh, what did you have to do? Like replace lights or? They were they, the, the lights were all battery operated. Uh huh. So on a regular schedule, you would go out to a light. They had battery pockets in them that you would pull the stack of batteries, and it's an oversized car battery except three high. Uh -huh. And you needed, you know, the crane to pull them out of there, the winch to pull them out of there. Uh, you would do any repair, I don't know how, but the ships would hit these buoys. <laughs> they lit, they make noise, but the ships would still hit them. Sometimes they would gash them in the side. Sometimes, they, they, like the cage on top that supported the light, mm -hmm. they might break that free. So our job was to get it, either get it on board or get it next to the ship, and, and I would do the welding on it to... to Mm -hmm. Get the superstructure reattached. Um, it sounds like it, it could have been dangerous work right, if the buoy was, you know, you're working off off the ship. Uh. It was. We, 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 they had a great system, and, it, and you could tell it was a homemade system that, mm -hmm. the, you know, the way you captured the buoy and got it on board under normal circumstances. And then there was. It can, if I can use other people's names, there was a, a seaman by the name of Dennis Collado from New York City. Uh -huh. And he was the nut. And if we got close and we couldn't quite hook the buoy the way they did with a boat pole and, and this little piece of wire that they, again, jury rigged up just uh -huh. for this purpose, if we couldn't get it, then Dennis would get on the, on the, the, the forecastle of the, the ship and time it just right and jump onto the cage that held the light. We had a, one of the, the work life jackets, but you know, I don't mm -hmm. know how long that would support you, but that was his only protection. He would jump by and grab onto that, and then we'd throw him a line. He'd attach a line, we'd pull it close, and hmm. then we'd take care of business from there. Now, how were those uh, buoys attached to the sea bottom? They're, uh, they, they, they know the depth of the water there, and they allow like 10% for a swing, and then there is at least one 12,000-pound uh, sinker on there, a cement sinker that they used mm -hmm. to make right there at Governor's Island. They'd have a forum, they'd have trucks pull up and, and, and pour these uh, sinkers. Uh -huh. And uh, some had two, three, or four. It all depended on where they were in the channel mm -hmm. and how, how the current was there just to keep them on, on, on station there. And that was the other thing. The ships would hit them or the ice might move them and drag them off station. So now it wasn't uh -huh. an accurate uh, reading for the ship, for mm -hmm. the channel. So we'd have to go back out and either drag them into place or pick everything back up, bring it onto the deck, and then redrop it. And again, it was it was it was you know you had very heavy chain, probably two inch mm -hmm. around chain, and they used to flake it out on the the deck, and then they hit this dog with a with a sledgehammer, and the thing would just go back and forth like that, and the weights would drop in the water, and then eventually you know you lower the buoy on, they disconnect the buoy, and, and be gone. It was heavy work. It was it yeah. was good hard work. Um, as a damage controlman, again, uh, there was some repairs to be done, but also my my uh, billet was this, on the special sea detail was to drop the in charge of the anchors mm -hmm. on the forecastle. So when we were in the harbor, you always had like a standby status special sea detail. So you mm -hmm. you stayed up there all day. Some days it got cold. Yeah. Other days it was just boring, but some days it was very cold up there. Mm -hmm. So, did you ever get to go to any exotic ports of call, or it was strictly along the the Atlantic coast or up into Canada? Well, I did when I was on the Gallatin, the weather cutter. We did do an uh, exercise with uh, some NATO uh, country ships, mm -hmm. and we did uh, spend some time in Halifax, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. which was nice. That was the only foreign port that I was ever to. Um, 
on the buoy tender, I mean, the only exact place we got was Bridgeport, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that's uh, one of the 40-foot patrol boats that I told you about stationed in Connecticut. They didn't do something right, and they actually sank the boat. Uh -huh. So we went over there with Navy divers, and we're able. The Navy divers were able to attach the lines, and we were able to pull the boat out of the bottom of uh, wherever we were, and bring it up to the surface. It took all day to bring it up to the surface and let the water, because we were over on the side pretty much, because it was that heavy. Yeah. We'll pick it up little by little, and finally got onto the deck, mm -hmm. and then took it back to Bridgeport. Spent the night there, mm -hmm. scenic Bridgeport. <laughs> Now, was that your last duty station? Uh, that was, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was there. I was on the, the fire bush for a couple of years. Okay. And uh, you were discharged in 73? Yeah. Uh, yes, January 73. Okay. And you were uh, in E5 at, at that Correct. Point? Okay. All right. And uh, did you have any desire to uh, join, like, the Navy Reserve or, or anything? Or? I didn't, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have got in the Coast Guard Reserve. Uh, and I did receive the talk that everybody receives about re-enlisting. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I had met the, the girl who would later become my wife and still is my wife. And, uh -huh. you know, I was just interested in getting discharged. Sure. Did you uh, make use of, were you eligible for the GI Bill? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I made use of that with uh, education credits for the police department. Mm -hmm. um, also, I made use of that for uh, my associate's degree. Mm -hmm. criminal justice, and I didn't use it for the mortgage, but I, I did use it for that. I used it for the dental the, the, the dental exam and, and the subsequent treatment uh, for a year after mm -hmm. your discharge. Um, thank God never had to make use of the VA other than that, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that was about it. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Uh, I'm a member, of, there's a local post in Albany. The American Legion post there. Okay. Did you uh, <coughs> stay in contact with anyone you served with? I do. Uh, there's a couple guys that I did. Uh, a guy from Syracuse, a guy from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't talked to him of late. Uh, there was another guy who was originally from New York City whose sister lived in Johnstown. And after he got out, he left the city and came up to Johnstown, lived with her, got on the police department in Johnstown. And retired as a sergeant up there, uh -huh. uh, so we've we've had contact all along the time there, mm -hmm. and uh, that's about it. A couple of guys, one guy would call me drunk every New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Did you attend any kind of reunions or anything? I, I there hasn't been anything that I that I've made made aware of. Okay. Um, there is a guy who was assigned to the fire bush who, I got to be honest, I don't remember him. Although he, the way he, and we've only conversed by email, but he indicates that he knew me. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty good with names, but uh, I, I don't remember him. I can't picture him. I, 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 someday i got to see a picture of him and see if I can pull him out like that. But he mentions the same guys that I knew on the ship, so mm -hmm. we had to be fairly close in time. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was just coming on when I was going off. I'm not sure. But Now, you were in during the Vietnam crisis. Correct. Did you um, ever run into any problems being in uniform with uh, protesters or anything like that? No, it was shortly after that I, I, I was on the Gallatin, and at that time, if you went on Liberty, you, were, you had to wear a uniform. Mm -hmm. It was shortly after I got off the Gallatin that they did away with that regulation that you had to be in uniform so you could wear civilian clothes, mm -hmm. and most of the guys did uh, when we went into New York City. And surprisingly, just being stationed within sight of New York City, not th not a lot of people took advantage of going in. We had our own movie theater on Governor's Island, mm -hmm. a bowling alley, you know, a couple bars. So um, we went into New York City, but only to visit a couple places. Didn't really see the sights or anything mm -hmm. else. And I was the type of guy that if I had liberty, I went home. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be home. So yeah. Now, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life dramatically? Um, number one, I grew up. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I, I, I believe I was introver introverted, um, and I was all set to go to Hudson Valley Community College to become a computer programmer. Again, in 1968, this is when they had the spindle cards and the round drum and the, the, the binary system. 
And then that summer I got a job driving a truck, delivering maintenance supplies, and it was about the third day of driving the truck that I realized that I was never going to be happy being inside at a desk. Mm -hmm. So I needed some time to decide what was going on. I, I, there was a friend, a, a guy I knew from Albany who was in the Coast Guard, and he said, you ought to look into it. So I went down and saw the recruiter, a guy by the name of Troy P. Rhodes. Now, how do I remember that? I don't know, but that was the name. <laughs> um, he signed me up, but again, it, he said his quota was full. He wouldn't be able to take me. That was in, uh, like, July. He wouldn't be able to take me to January. Mm -hmm. So I went home and told my parents that uh, I was going to go in the Coast Guard and that I wasn't going to be going to Hudson Valley. And my father got upset because I think he had put down a $5 deposit. And <laughs> he wanted his money back, so we got the money back. But I think he was proud of me. He was, he was uh, Army uh -huh. during World War II, so I think he was happy about that. And uh, my oldest brother was seven years in the Navy, so he was kind of happy about that. He had mm -hmm. gotten out probably eight or ten years before, maybe eight years before I enlisted. Mm -hmm. And he was a big influence as to what the, you know where I wanted to be assigned and what type of work I wanted to do. Yeah. So he helped me out a great deal with that. Um, other ways it helped me, it, it gave me that time to grow up. Mm -hmm. It gave me responsibility. It gave me uh, a trade, more or less, because with the things that I learned there, I was able to make repairs not only on board ship, but also as I got out at my own home, at other people's homes. Knew a little bit about plumbing, you know, size of pipe and things like that. Mm -hmm. Wasn't afraid to tackle some jobs. Um, all the time I was in work for, work for the police, that uh, I always had sideline jobs, and one of that was welding and cutting steel, a trade that I learned or a skill that I learned when I was in service. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, since I've retired from the police, being in the uh, building maintenance end of it. It's, uh, again, it's an inch and a half pipe is still an inch and a half pipe, whether it's steel or plastic, you know. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of things that are still pertinent today that I learned in, 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 on the ship. Mm -hmm. The care and use of tools, you know, the proper use of a pipe wrench, let's say, the proper use of a saw, mm -hmm. uh, all things that I learned there. So I, I, I think I learned a great deal. I think it was four years well spent. Mm -hmm. um, I don't regret any of it. So it's, it's a good thing. Okay. Thank you so much for your interview. Thank you.